Good evening, everyone. I, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Kava session. The session is titled Strife on the Streets, Responding to Kinetic Info Wars. Today in the chair, we have Ms. Katrina Heinel. May I request Ms. Heinel to begin the session uh, and briefly introduce the panelists. Great, thank you. It's got very mod con since we were here last uh, with the button, so thank you very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great privilege to be here with you all, and um, I would like to thank, sorry, it's a little bit of a, um, I'd like to thank ORF and the Ministry of External Affairs in advance, um, because it is, as I say, a great privilege to return to the Rizina Dialogue, uh, to engage once again in frank discussion and encourage debate, as is the way at ORF and that we're all well used to. So tonight we hope to discuss uh, the responses to the weaponization of information that has been conducted not only by state actors but also by non-state actors. ORF has explained that the aim of this session is to be informative, to be engaging, which we promise to be, and I think with the, the group that we have this evening it certainly will be. However, um, I do want to do more than channel my inner Graham Norton at a time when the mood is truly sombre and debate could not be more important. What is it we are really trying to achieve here this evening? How can our discussants, each um, highly expert in their own right, um, how, how can their remarks be meaningful and impactful? Is it to inform and to educate? Is it to shed light on different perspectives? Or is it to bring about desired change? Globally, we've heard from many speakers this evening, we are coming out of a pandemic that strained our ability to come together meaningfully, to learn, to listen, to hear different positions, and most important, to sustain trust and dialogue. The information sphere has been both an enabler, but also a, a disabler for sustaining this fragile trust among states, but also in, in our um, commerce. <coughs> So this session asks us to think about these ways to reduce the impact of nefarious online informational activity. It is timely where a key priority in many parts of the world, including Europe, at a time of war is to, uh, to counter disinformation. Yet here I see important debates, which I hope we will get to in the discussion section, in the Indian press about the sophistication of both Russian but also non-Russian disinformation and hybrid campaigns during time of war. So in other words, countering of Russian disinformation is being viewed as another version of disinformation, an information campaign in its own right. The question I'm hearing is which version of the truth should a nation of one billion plus people believe? What is certainly different, before I introduce our panellists, in 2022 than history has showed us about the malign use of information by states and non-state actors is the scale, breadth and fast pace of the informational environment, where there are, less, there are lessons from the past, but the playbook is being rewritten and revised. So with that, I re I'm delighted to introduce our five panellists. Many of you know each other already, um, but um, I'm, I'm happy that we're here together to provide their own thoughts about how to go about these um, uh, solutions. First off, our first panellist is retired General Rajesh Pant, the National Cybersecurity Coordinator at the Prime Minister's Office here in India. So it's good to meet again, Rajesh. Our second panellist is Henri Verdier, who is the French Ambassador for Digital Affairs. Our third panellist is the British Minister for Defence Procurement, uh, Jeremy Quinn. Fourthly, we have Erin Saltman, who is apparently no stranger to, to Rizina um, and ORF. Erin um, is the Director of Programming at the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism in the United States. And lastly, um, it is also a great privilege to meet Janka Ertel, who is the Director of the Asia Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations. So, we have 40 minutes in and around before we then open up to Q&A. Um, we, we really, as a, as a group, decided beforehand that we want to keep this conversation flowing and light um, and to engage with you as a group um, uh, here for the evening. So with that, I'm going to ask the first driving question from ORF. I'm going to ask um, uh, Rajesh to, to, to open uh, the floor. And the question is, what are the key vulnerabilities of the information ecosystem that make it susceptible to nefarious actors? So Rajesh, over to you and thank you. 
Thank you, Katriona. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was told this is a conversation over kava, which is a excellent uh, hot, warm drink from Kashmir with uh, cardamom, but I don't see any of it around. <laughs> so maybe we'll have to remind Sameer to do something. But uh, uh, thank you, Katriona, for setting the ball rolling. Uh, you mentioned about the vulnerabilities in the information ecosystem that make it prone to the bad actors. So it's important to understand what is an information ecosystem before we go on to you know understanding its vulnerabilities. Uh, basically, it is something like what is happening exactly here. So there is a producer of information, that is me. I'm going through a network. It is coming to you. You are the consumers of information. And then there are various other aspects. You know, There are some influencers and uh, stuff like that. So it's, it's a complex system. It's defined as an adaptive uh, system that uh, includes info infrastructure that I mentioned, tools, media, producers, consumers, curators, and sharers. That is what the ecosystem is all about. Now, why is it vulnerable? And each of these components that I mentioned, there is vulnerability in each one of them. For example, in the network, uh, the entire uh, the social media system rides on the internet. And the internet, if you're aware, when it started off years back in DARPA in the US, was meant only for sharing information. There was no secrecy involved in that. That is what the internet protocol is. They don't check from where the packets are coming, where they are going, they don't verify. In the next version of the internet protocol, IPv6, when it comes, there will be you know some more uh, internet checks. So firstly, the network itself is vulnerable. Then the uh, producer of information. There is no verification. I can be the you know, the vice president of India and why I said vice president is because exactly that is what is happening. There's somebody who's masquerading as the vice president of India and sending WhatsApp messages to many people. It's a case someone told me in the morning only. So there is no verification of the user credentials. So that is the next vulnerability that in our information system, uh, they, there is, you know, fake identities and on all our WhatsApp and um, Instagrams and the Facebook, etc. Then uh, there is uh, no, I mean, attribution. It's so difficult to attribute uh, uh, from where the source came and things like that. Uh, on the receiver side, on the consumer side, I would say there is a lack of technical awareness also. And there is a sense of gullibility. We tend to, you know, just uh, believe that uh, what is coming is uh, true. Uh, there is no, uh, you know, checking, fact checking for fake news, uh, disinformation. Uh, recently, I'm glad that uh, the, in the U EU, they've come out with the uh, DSA, the Digital uh, uh, Security Act, I think just uh, two, three days back, where there are some uh, guidelines which, you know, intermediaries have to follow. Then, of course, we come to the use of bots. Uh, we'll talk of bots uh, subsequently also as to how they are being used for uh, spreading, uh, uh, unleashing disinformation, etc. And all of you are also aware of the trolls, the factories, uh, which is an institutionalized group that seeks to interfere in political opinions and decision making. And then, of course, there are social influences, you know, the ones that are professionals. And uh, the point is that it is more cost effective to spread uh, fake news uh, on these social media channels uh, than otherwise. So that, that th those are the major vulnerabilities. What are the limitations? Limitations are that there are no international rules and regulations against these perpetrators of whatever I said are taking advantage of these vulnerabilities. I mean, the, the cyber criminals. And the, advantage, the, the example of the UN gr group of government experts is there, you know, loud and clear. From uh, 2004 onwards, it took uh, uh, almost 18 to 20 years to come out with those 11 non-binding norms of responsible behavior by uh, states on uh, in the cyberspace. And non-binding norms, mind you. And one of those norms, as all of you are aware, is that a state will not use its territory to attack the critical infrastructure of another state in cyberspace. Is that happening? We all are aware what is happening. So, I mean, this is what people are taking advantage of. Then one other thing is that technology is always ahead of policy. You know, today, at least in India, I can tell you, we are working on a Cyber Security Act, uh, whereas ransomware is already there and um, uh, crypto is already there. Uh, but metaverse is already coming in. Metaverse with digital uh, twins and digital identities. and So uh, there, are, there are no rules for metaverse yet. We are still grappling with the present world of cyberspace today. How do we handle metaverse? 
so technology is always ahead of policy which is which is a big limitation in uh, you know trying to prevent uh, this thing then of course the patching of vulnerabilities takes time software updates take time supply chain vulnerabilities you're all aware as to how uh, some major cases took place in the us about uh, the uh, solar winds case um, when you know it spread to all those 18000 clients etc and then um, the problems of open source software and this recent uh, uh, vulnerability we had on the log 4j web shell uh, where again uh, all the accounts were uh, compromised because uh, it was part of the open source software being used in various applications so uh, finally of course there's an asymmetry that uh, you know guy with one laptop can create an effect which in otherwise in the real world would require much more effort so these are the major vulnerabilities and limitations in the information ecosystem that uh, you know uh, make it uh, very attractive for the bad actors to do what they are doing in disinformation and other things thank you very much thanks so much rajesh um onri i'd love to hear your thoughts now if that's okay okay good evening uh, and thank you for sharing this moment with us uh, i hope we'll have a great conversation do do i yes i it's better with the mic okay so first i would like to remind because some people start to forget this that democracy is a strong and resilient model we are quiet so some people consider us as weak but at the end when we have to face risk we face and some and very often we win and that um, democracy needs freedom of expression freedom of press and free and informed elections and i want to remind also that um, internet and even the social network did create a real space for innovation uh, information solidarity self organization and then democracy so that's important because of course we speak more and more about uh, disinformation misinformation hate polarization etc which has actual troubles but we have to start from the starting point and the starting point is democracy is great and free, and those internet and social network are great then let's try not to be naive we have to face new risk and severe risk so i want to speak to much or i want to speak at all about cybersecurity espionage uh, privacy issues general pont did and uh, we all know that we have very important issues here and i will stay focus on disinformation and here i just want to share with you that basically we have to face two different types of risks so first and we'll speak again about this and maybe later i will share some examples but of course bad actors using those networks on platforms can develop and deploy um, more modern and very efficient forms of propaganda with fake news with deep fake with uh, social engineering with big data with uh, personal advertising comportmental advertising and they have a lot of tools to to make um, new approaches of the of the good old fashioned uh, information war so we we have to know this to to organize ourselves to to, de to detect it and to tackle this and the second point is that the, i strongly believe uh, and i'm sorry if i obfuscate someone here i strongly believe that the design and business model of the of most of the social ne network create a space of vulnerability yes this attention economy and the personal advertising the fact that uh, people are isolated in filtering in filter bubble uh, the echo chamber effect the polarization induced by the business model because you, uh, we want more and more engage small micro worlds is a threat on democracy because this model is really a cable it's very easy to to hack this model and to to promote nervosity polarization hate fear um, and we will have to face this and maybe we'll speak later about how to to face this but i would just want to conclude with a last idea so we have these two kinds of risk but if we get wrong answers if we weaken democracy with our answers we may win some intermediate victories but at the end we will 
have lost democracy. And maybe the most difficult part of this conversation is that we, we have to invent s s some new models. We cannot just make a counter propaganda, a counter disinformation, a counter censorship. <laughs> we need to invent something with, within the rules of law, within the democratic system, with the civil society, with a level of transparency, of accountability. And that's, of course, a, a very important issue here. Thank you. Thank you, Henri. Um, Erin, I think um, your, your background um, and experience um, would also speak to this question. And then when you're ready to also segue into um, uh, another question identified by ORF, which is how can states and corporations limit offline harms of online disinformation activity? So I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Sure. And again, like everyone before, many thanks to Raisin and ORF for this incredible stage to be able to talk to everyone on. I'm coming at this from when we talk about bad actors, specifically looking at terrorists and violent extremists. And that takes different forms in different parts of the world, but every country has their own form of hate-based violence that emerges. And specifically, I work with tech companies on this issue. And so from that perspective, it looks a little bit different. We were invented as an NGO by tech for tech. So the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism was created by tech companies, but with multi-stakeholderism by design, because you cannot counter terrorism without government at the table, without human rights perspectives at the table, without practitioners at the table. Uh, and when we look at significant vulnerabilities, I think we always say the internet or echo chambers as if it may be one thing, but a question, who has just one app on their phone? Just one. Okay, who has more, just one app? Oh, okay, fair enough. Uh, and who has more than 10 apps on their phone? Okay, over 90%, maybe 98 if we're being honest. So we shouldn't be naive that bad actors are exactly the same. We go on one platform to have more private communications with our closest peers. We go on another platform to be a little bit more public or maybe a little bragging, maybe a little clout within whether it's our business or our friend group. We go to another place to store some content if we want to save pictures or photos off our phones, off our videos. We go to another if we want to place an ad or maybe we have a small and medium business and we go to marketplace and we get money that way and bad actors are no different. So we have a difference between private areas for communication, storage where we keep our store propaganda, and then amplification sites. So we see right now this diversification of how bad actors, just like good actors, use the internet because it's never been cheaper, easier, more transnational, and faster to get this done. So all the same things that make all of these tools amazing in our day to day are also going to be reappropriated by bad actors, and we just shouldn't be naive to that. So what we can think through then is where does that take us? And I would say that governments have, in many respects, pushed at least the most obvious companies or the most vulnerable that have been affected by terrorism and violent extremism to the table. If we look at the EU Internet Forum or the Christchurch Call to Action or the UN Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, they really did push companies to create bodies like the NGO that I work for, or to create models where they forced more transparency. But I would say that even if I look at my organization, I have 18 tech platforms. It includes big ones like Meta and Amazon and Microsoft and Twitter and some small ones like Mega and Just Paste It that maybe you've never heard of. But there's a lot of platforms out there that are not coming to the table. And so in the future, what we're seeing is that there's going to be platforms that are willing to come to the table and platforms that are not. And there are going to be platforms that come from democratically principled countries and platforms that do not. And they have different legal frameworks that they are beholden to. And when we come to defining bad actors, whether that's terrorists or if we talk about misinformation, different countries are defining these bad actors in very different ways. And so if you just look at definitions of terrorists or terrorist lists, and then something like misinformation has been very difficult because uh, it's not illegal to lie online. There's nothing, if I say you're wearing a yellow shirt and you're wearing a blue shirt, who cares? And actually normative speech, if I say I'm gonna kill you online, I don't know tone. So threat assessment is also hard because I don't know if I'm saying, I'm gonna kill you or I'm gonna kill you. And actually even in caps, I don't know, maybe it's ironic. And so threat detection is really multi-signal. And so into the second of where can states and corporations limit offline harms 
with online disinformation, the more we can define what we mean by a harm, the more we can build the tools around it to find it. So if I say a really clear terrorist organization like Daesh or ISIS, I can use logo detection on top of threat analysis of language, on top of network analysis of who I know that has been identified as being removed for being part of this group. If we talk about mis- and disinformation, it's still very ill-defined. So when you say to a tech company, remove misinformation while not harming free speech, we do need a lot more government dialogue to explain exactly what sort of speech we're talking about. Conspiracy theories, we're probably not talking about the Bigfoot conspiracy. Uh, although, give a violent extremist group the opportunity, I'm sure we could turn it into something one day. But we really have to define what we mean by it. And the two tactics being used by violent extremist groups around misinformation are called basically flooding or fogging. So if an event happens, there are two tactics I could do if I want to confuse you. I could flood you with one alternative narrative so that you see it from different places and you go, huh, well, that narrative I hear in the mainstream, I don't know, that just... I've heard, I've heard another version, so it's planted that seed of doubt. Or I could fog you with a million different other alternatives that you say, well, I just don't know what the truth is anyways, and you walk away. And those are the two tactics we see, not just with some state actors, but with violent extremists and terrorists in this space. But the more we can define it, we can actually apply a myriad of tools to identify, review, and remove that type of content. Thanks so much, Aaron. Um, so I'm going to pass the floor to um, uh, Jeremy. Um, thank you, Trina. And uh, Aaron, I thought that was fascinating and very scary. So much so that when you started your remarks, no one had a drink, and now half of the room <laughs> has turned to alcohol. Um, the, but if I may start, though, by actually referring to something uh, Henri said, which was about the uh, uh, internet as, as being vital to freedom and an asset to democracy. And of course, I would uh, entirely agree. And Henri also said, though, that we were uh, we can't be naive. And I'm I think it's just curious that Berners Lee uh, invented the World Wide Web in '89, the same year that the uh, Berlin Wall came down, and uh, the two things moved in parallel subsequently, that perhaps we, as a society, uh, just got very familiar with, we can all went through a period of perhaps significant naivety when we thought the end of history and all that. Everything was flowing our way, everything was going to be perfect, and the internet and complete freedom of expression and freedom of speech was something which was going to prevent autocracy. I don't think any of us in uh, the early heady days of the World Wide Web ever imagined that the internet was going to be uh, something that would be abused uh, by bad actors. It was something that was going to make life harder for bad actors because you'd have freedom of expression uh, um, globally. Uh, clearly, we were being uh, naive. Uh, we, uh, like so many, have picked up on this as part of our integrated review and defence command paper uh, last year. We uh, um, reinforced our national uh, cyber force and absolutely discussed uh, the grey zone as a key component of making certain that we are uh, prepared that what could be uh, thrown at us um, as a state uh, on, in all kinds of areas, be it disinformation uh, from uh, non-state actors or uh, terrorist organisations or indeed uh, state actors. Uh, Katrina asked me to talk particularly about what can we do to uh, try and head it off and prevent uh, some of the abuses that uh, disinformation can uh, create, and we know what those abuses are. Uh, it's a process by which you can uh, seek to, um, through highly sophisticated disinformation, demoralise and uh, degrade the moral element of an adversary. Uh, you can garner sympathy and support uh, on a global basis for uh, your cause, and uh, suppress views at home. And we've seen attempts to try and do that, very obviously, in the tragic circumstances that we're currently seeing uh, played out in uh, Ukraine. So how do you kill off that disinformation? How do you try and uh, uh, prevent it having its intended effect? Um, well, others here on this panel are more expert than me, and we could have a long discussion purely uh, related to that. Uh, but I think the, the three points I would uh, I, I would mention. The first is simply uh, the process of, of calling it out. In March 2020, uh, we responded to some of the stuff going on with COVID, working with civil authorities and with uh, academia, 
uh, to ensure that some of the uh, extreme COVID disinformation campaign was drawn to the attention of providers, that they could act on that and were encouraged uh, to do so. Where it was clear uh, disinformation being provided, uh, which is going to be harmful and uh, injurious to, um, uh, to people's health and with mal uh, intent. The uh, more relevantly right now and immediately, uh, we've seen what's been going on uh, in Ukraine. Acting swiftly in response to this information is incredibly important. Uh, you may have forgotten because we've got other things going on in the Black Sea recently, but about a year ago, June of last year, uh, there was an incident in the Black Sea where HMS Defender uh, had an incident with um, uh, 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 Russian uh, Air Force, which was uh, something we, they weren't even picked up on at the time. It was, there was, it was a non-incident. didn't happen, uh, but uh, well, it did happen, but it was uh, not um, uh, within uh, sight or range of, uh, of Defender. Uh, but in retrospect, we weren't quick enough at getting the truth out into the public domain. So it was around the world uh, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, certain actions had taken place at Defender at Alton Course, uh, which was uh, not the case, and uh, we weren't fast enough in getting a correct narrative out, uh, which we knew to be uh, the case, and there was, a, there was a, a market out there to understand it. I think what you've seen with Kiev over the recent uh, weeks is extraordinarily swift, effective, and consistent messaging from a leadership that is widely trusted. And it's been highly effective at countering uh, a narrative, and I uh, absolutely credit them with how they've been able to do that. Uh, I think the, there have been other examples of heading off disinformation. Perhaps one of the most effective has been heading it off before the pass. Actually, when you know uh, that disinformation is being planned before it's actually out there uh, on the internet, uh, declassifying intelligence to say, this is going to happen. It's going to be a, um, a false flag att attack. It's going to be people are going to pretend that there's a um, uh, that X, Y, or Z is happening. Uh, it's going to happen uh, next Tuesday week. Uh, be aware before it happens. And there is no more effective way of destroying uh, disinformation than calling it out uh, before it's even happened. Um, and I think there is a huge market that that gets you into in terms of just being prepared, being seen to be credibly a sober assessor of what's going on. Uh, we in the Ministry of Defence, throughout the Ukraine uh, crisis, throughout the Ukraine war, have been attempting to put out uh, what we see as the plain unvarnished truth, a sober assessment of what is happening uh, day by day uh, in Ukraine. And it's interesting that some of the more traditional uh, purveyors of news um, have seen an increase in their uh, uh, viewership, if that's the right word, the BBC, has, the World Service, has seen a significant increase uh, throughout the region in people uh, listening and watching it, uh, despite attempts to, uh, 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 to uh, um, stymie its ability to get to its audience. Um, the, the third point I'd say, and then we're not allowed to move on in terms of destroying uh, disinformation, which I think bad actors now need to be very, very aware of, is particularly in a war situation, uh, the open source availability of information absolutely can be damning evidence as to what is really going on. And uh, we saw it, uh, President Madeleine uh, referred earlier to the awful, awful things that she had seen in, in, in uh, Bucha and that uh, horrific incident. And uh, we know that it's information that was put out, that this all happened after uh, Russian troops had departed and uh, civilian actors were able to see via satellite imagery, no, this is the evidence, and caught it out before any state uh, was doing that. It is plain unvarnished truth that people can actually see and, uh, and, and understand, uh, in the same way uh, that uh, the impact of uh, ordinary Ukrainian farmers, it appears, uh, taking to tractors uh, to cart off um, their adversaries' uh, armoured fighting vehicles, has an extremely um, uh, persuasive uh, view or when, when seen internationally. Uh, try and sell a message of uh, blistering success uh, when uh, you've got uh, tractors uh, departing with your, uh, uh, with your armor fighting vehicles, with your tanks. So I think there are, this is still early days in this whole uh, process, uh, but we are understanding more and more about how you can, uh, uh, how you can show disinformation for what it is and try and prevent uh, the benefits that people perceive uh, can flow uh, from their attempts to, uh, uh, to, to, to undermine 
uh, the, uh, the, their adversaries' proposition. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, so, Yanka, you've been very patient, um, but I guess you've had lots of time to also hear from uh, the other panellists as well. So. Um, uh, before I uh, pass the floor to Yanka, what I love about uh, the, the, this particular panel that ORF has put together is the kind of the different um, backgrounds and disciplines and lens that everybody brings in their day to day work. So with that, Yanka is looking at this, um, a lot of this work from a very Asia Pacific perspective. So Yanka, over to you. Thank you very much, Katerina, and, uh, and I was going to give that disclaimer as well. I am by no means, as my title says there, I'm the director of the Asia program, by no means a disinformation expert, um, but I would like to bring this to a bit of a real-life example, um, because disinformation, as we were talking about offline and online, offline harms of online disinformation, can also change the face of interstate relations. Um, and we have seen this in Europe very much um, at a time where it was slightly unexpected. So um, let me just take you really briefly um, to just a kind of anecdotally and say, you know, relations between Europe and China were really good for a long time. You know, we made a lot of money. I'm from Germany. I'm based in Berlin. So we had great times. Um, German industry made a lot of money. Um, and it was all just about business. It wasn't about politics. And it was very well. Changes in the relationship happened, particularly around the 5G conversation, where we already had a glimpse into how does a security threat emerge from the digital space in the European theater, from something that is kind of coming towards us from, uh, from Asia, from China, um, in the face of Chinese vendors that were perceived as threats to the infrastructure um, of the future of our telecommunication systems. But more strikingly, actually, was during the pandemic, the fact that Chinese disinformation contributed massively to the deterioration of the perception of China in European societies. So it actually had a real life effect um, on how, you know, when disinformation was called out, European publics were perceiving China as an actor during the pandemic and had an actual impact um, on how the relationship between states, between governments um, and the Chinese government have then shaped, were then shaped in the future. And I would like to then come to what Jeremy's been, been talking about um, in his remarks and say, this can even be going a lot further. Um, and that brings me to a big question that we currently have to face. If we look at the war in Ukraine and we look at China's reaction um, to it and China's support um, for the, the Russian position um, very actively, then um, it brings us to the realm where disinformation, particularly amplification of Russian disinformation, is actually contributing to the stabilization um, of the Russian regime, is, uh, is contributing actively to how the war can proceed. Um, and we're having this debate at the moment in Europe where the red line would be. So if China were to support um, Russia militarily, most policymakers in Europe would say, that's, you know, that would be a clear red line. That's a real problem. If there are weapons being delivered to Moscow, that would be a clear red line. But I think we are in an age where we have to question ourselves whether the amplification um, of the biolabs conversation, for example, isn't already contributing to the way the war is proceeding, isn't already an act of contribution in that form um, that, could, should consider, um, that we should consider a red line in kind of the way we deal um, with, um, with China in this confrontation. So I was just wanted to just pose that and, and put that out there as a question because I think this is not something abstract. This is something that we are facing right now in everyday policy decisions um, and the degree to which, by choice, um, the Chinese government has chosen to use this moment to um, improve its own strategic position in the broader narrative warfare that is going on in kind of parallel to the confrontation in Ukraine, um, playing out mainly um, also in the countries of the global south, is, um, is quite um, a significant change in, in how this has happened in the past. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of it. And I think Speaking from a European perspective, we're not ready for it. Thank you, Janke. Um, I would imagine now that you've all had a few whiskies or glasses of wine, you're all dying to jump in. So I'm going to uh, pass the floor. Um, I think Henri ha had one or two points he wanted to raise on, on this question and um, Rajesh then as well. Is that, that's right, Henri? Okay. Yeah. Uh, about how to tackle those, uh, those threats. So just I want to share with you our convictions, France convictions, that transparency and accountability can be used as effective tools to face this situation. And first I want to, to speak about uh, something maybe we, you saw last week online, 
uh, about bad actors and disinformation. Maybe you have heard last week about a particularly despicable attempt by Russian mercenaries in Mali. The French army did film with drones, Wagner mercenaries burying bodies to make it look like a mass grave left by Barkhane, so the French army, near the Gossi base. But we, we know how those people act, and we were prepared. We decided to, 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 to be sure to document everything they did uh, since uh, we, we left the country with our drones, etc. And we did film them. And then we decided to, we, we had chosen transparency as a weapon in this battle. So we decided to reveal everything to the press, not just to denounce, but to explain the methodology, how they act, uh, how they organize, how they use Twitter, etc. And that's one example of an approach that democracy can, can use. Uh, we didn't try to make a, a counter manipulation and to, to, to build another a fake grave. We did make a, the better transparency we could uh, about this particular event. And we were prepared and we did plan this for weeks on weeks. So that was one example I wanted to share with you to say that uh, countering this information is not just about uh, counter propaganda and it's not just talk and talk and talk. We can act, you can prepare yourself, you can use some tools and some weapon and you can be very strong and quiet and, um, and present. The second point, because I, I spoke a bit about the, the fact that the design of the social network is an issue by itself, so, as you may know, we did adopt in Europe, sorry for our cousin of UK, a very important regulation, which is the Digital Service Act. We did um, adopt last Friday. Um, I won't explain tonight, because we don't have time, the principles of the Digital Service Act. Just to mention that the main idea is to build a strong um, accountability framework. So, the, the companies will have to present to an independent authority, but, but with a strong power of audit. First, a risk analysis. But if they say, for example, no, no, I promise we won't have a new uh, January 6 and a new attack of the capital, we'll say, okay, can I, not, not us, not the government, not states, but the independent authority will have the, the right to say, okay, show me the algorithm, show me the data, show me the content that you did delete, explain me why, explain me how, and we will have this conversation, and then they will have to propose a fixation plan to fix the, the threat, and again in front of the, the same independent authority. And we consider that we are trying to do what we did collectively, the international committee, with the banking system years ago. So we will open a, a constant interaction to improve every year a better and better compliance system. And, uh, I consider this as very important, and I want to, to share with you a last idea, and then I shut up. Because, of course, when we start thinking, speaking about this regulation, uh, European legislation, so some people tell us, uh, but we are undermining the unique internet, the net neutrality, you are fragmentizing, etc. And I just want to share with you the, this very important idea. Internet is the infrastructure that we did invent in 1917. And that Sir Tim Berners-Lee did improve in France, <laughs> in the CERN, in Geneva, uh, in uh, 1919. Uh, and Internet works well, thank you for him. Internet has no trouble, not one minute of dysfunction during 50 years. And Internet relies on a multi-stakeholder, multilateral governance, and we consider this as very important, and that's very okay. And then we have the companies, and the companies are not Internet. Uh, a classical social network is uh, centralized, where internet is decentralized, is non-neutral. Internet is neutral. The companies curate the content and promote the content. And, uh, internet is open. You can understand how it works. You can observe the algorithm. The companies don't do this. Internet is free. You can put your computer on internet and create something. You have to negotiate with the company. So that, that are two completely different set of rules. And we can have two different set of regulation. So I just want to say with you that when we try to regulate the companies in a very kind framework, a conversational framework, it doesn't undermine at all the governance of internet. So thank you for the opportunity to, to make these two important points. 
I just want to <coughs> change the tack a bit. And uh, one of the reasons, despite the internet being so good in France, but still the disinformation is uh, continuing. And one of the reasons is the use of bots. Uh, as you're all aware, you know, bots are these uh, software programs uh, with an algorithm that spreads, uh, depending on you know what you want to spread on a keyword or something, it is planted on a particular uh, uh, platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And then this is used is being used very effectively uh, by uh, uh, these uh, threat actors to spread disinformation. So despite the fact that there are about four and a half billion people using the internet, there are almost a billion bots, including in all the you know, platforms. And there are good bots and there are bad bots. There are good bots in the sense that there are some activities that are used to monitor the platforms uh, by the platforms themselves. Uh, and there are uh, industrial bots, which are also good bots. But the bad bots are the ones that we are concerned about. And that is uh, what I want to just highlight uh, as one of the points of discussion as to what can we do to counter these bad bots. A number of uh, things are already being done by the social media platforms. Uh, there are uh, uh, aspects like perspective was created by Google. And then uh, Facebook had launched something called Deep Text which is also an artificial intelligence based tool. So artificial intelligence can be used very effectively because if you want to suddenly find out why this message has spread so rapidly and why so many pages are being scanned. So that's one easy way of finding out, you know, and tackle bots. Uh, in addition, uh, there are these fact checkers uh, in every country, you know, you have some trusted portals. In fact, when I was having dinner, this guy sitting next to me, uh, he's, he's got a fighting misinformation globally. That's the card he gave to me. I don't know how he came and sat next to me. His company is called News Mo Mobile. He, he's a fact checker. So uh, there are Snopes and you know all those other sites are there. So that's another uh, aspect that uh, uh, corporations, uh, corporates and nations can use. Use of uh, artificial intelligence, machine language is uh, helping in a big way in this. There is manual monitoring. Uh, for example, Facebook uh, has got about 20,000 actual employees who are uh, doing content monitoring. So a mix of uh, manual plus uh, the use of technology, I would uh, suggest is the best sort of solution. In technology, you know, you have these photo DNA uh, stuff that uh, compares the pictures of uh, these child sexual offenses and immediately blocks them, etc. And uh, uh, the various tools, uh, Twitter is using labeling, so you might get a message that, you know, this is a fake or something like that. So, uh, uh, you know, these are the uh, tools, uh, whether you use people, whether you use processes, whether you use technology. But I think uh, uh, besides what uh, has been discussed earlier, uh, the nation states as well as the corporates have to utilize these sort of methods also to counter disinformation. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Rajesh. Um, I'm thinking with the permission of my um, fellow panelists that um, in the interest of time and also the, the, the time of the evening that I would prefer to open up uh, to the floor. We did have um, we did it, we did our homework, we did it diligently, we did have a lot more um, uh, to discuss uh, and a third question. So I will invite our panellists, um, uh, should they want to raise any points they didn't have uh, time to get to, to do so. Um, please just um, uh, try and get my attention. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to open the floor and um, uh, hear from all of you. Um, I understand there are a lot of experts uh, here in the room as well. So um, once we get the, the first intervention or question, I find um, it, it all kicks off from there. Yes, oh, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, thank you, this is, this is Hong Chao Liu, I'm an independent journalist based in Paris. Uh, I'm one of the uh, AF, AFGG fellows. Uh, I actually have a question, I want to pick up a point that Yang Kao just made about China. Um, the scenario that China can potentially support the amplification of this information about the Russia war. And I, unfortunately, I have to say that has, has already happened uh, within China, but probably not uh, much less elsewhere. And, and my question is, is really related to that. Um, how do we deal with the propaganda machine that is uh, systemically generating disinformation on a lot of issues uh, within China, 
uh, that can potentially impact um, global, uh, let's say, international relations. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, if I don't see any other questions, burning questions yet, I might just ask Yanka if she wouldn't mind. Yeah, and of course, I'll invite our other panelists if you like to as well. Yeah, just say a few words about it and then maybe we can we can open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, I fully agree with you. It has already happened and it has already a real life impact. That's precisely what I was trying to trying to convey um, and that it is uh, larger in terms of scale than we are currently perceiving. Um, I just wanted to, for those that are not following this so clearly, just give another little bit of an example of how it looks like at the moment. When we had the biolabs conversation starting in Russian media, um, the Chinese spokesperson of the foreign ministry um, was raising the issue in, um, Aaron, you were saying so wonderfully, you can flood or fog. Um, you can also just flood and fog, you know, you can just do both at the same time. So what was happening was then to just open up this array of whataboutisms and saying the US has used Agent Orange in, in Vietnam and there's chemical weapons use in Syria and biological weapons have been used in Korea and obviously this is what they're doing. You know that this is always what they're doing. And this is an official government account that is tweeting that out um, and has enormous repetition um, in, in the world and how it's being perceived. Um, and for, I think for um, us in the kind of more political and not so kind of technical world, the question is, as what do you rate that? You know, is that is that kind of is that how how is that political support? Is that military support? And what kind of you know is it diplomatic support? Um, what kind of level does it pass? Um, and what is the overall effect when these kinds of messages, in terms of the global um, perception of, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at um, how kind of Chinese news stations have uh, transformed into very normal news stations are being um, listened to and, and viewed all over the world, um, particularly in cable networks in the developing world, um, are part of the normal news program, then this becomes quite um, an, a potent um, potential that the collaboration between um, China and Russia in this space can have. I would say before Ukraine, we haven't seen it to this degree, um, and uh, it, and the, I'm not speaking about within China. I'm only talking like with terms in terms of the global narrative, um, and I think we need to quickly wrap our head around what it will mean um, and what the measures are that we can find in terms of taking probably the similar steps has been has been discussed here of calling it out, creating transparency, creating swift responses to that, um, but it's going to become very hard. Can I just uh, interject here and add to what Yanka said and what happens when states create fake news? And, uh, you know, we've all heard of the 50 cent army in China and uh, almost 2 billion people, and I'm just reading what I read in the news, 2 billion people employed and 450 million posts uh, posted by them every year basically to promote Chinese culture and, you know, the government propaganda. And why it's called 50 cent is because they get 50 cent, I'm told, for every fake news that they post. So that is another question as to, you know, what happens when we are trying to fight disinformation, but what happens when it is state-sponsored? Thank you. Thanks so much, Rajesh. Please, yeah. And if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please introduce yourself. And then I see another question here, so we'll take both. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jan. I'm from the Netherlands and uh, also one of the young fellows here today. Uh, my question is about um, trying to understand some of the sources of disinformation, uh, perhaps uh, most to uh, Aaron, given your work with uh, social media companies. Um, I've been following developments in Ukraine very closely. One of the ways I do so is Twitter. And uh, then, of course, you also come across lots of disinformation. And one of the things I noticed is that when you look into the profiles and the people who are actively spreading this information, you scroll down a bit, you see that until about three months ago, when this was still relevant, they were mostly promoting uh, COVID disinformation. And uh, it's surprising because one would presume that, you know, somebody focuses on a particular topic based on their interests. And it seems unlikely that the interests can be both health issues and uh, Eastern European, um, you know, security issues. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what does this mean in terms of understanding these echo chambers and these, these groups uh, where disinformation prevails, that they can so quickly hop from one topic to the other? And how does that affect um, the, the strategies that you would employ for combating disinformation? Thank you. Aaron, before you um, jump in, I think we had a question over here.
been. Unfortunately, I'm not one of the young fellows anymore. I envy you. Um, I heard you had a wonderful program. Um, what I wanted to ask is um, about the gray areas um, and political communication during times of crisis and wars. And Janka, I wanted to ask you specifically because we currently have in, in Germany a very intense debate uh, between our Bundes about our Bundespräsident uh, Steinmeier, um, our f f former foreign minister um, Gabriel and the Ukrainian um, ambassador. And both sides are accusing each other um, of not telling exactly the truth. Um, and my question is, what are the lines for communication during times of crises? And um, where does it become problematic for support? And where, on the other hand, if you don't do it, does it become problematic for an open and honest discourse in our societies? So how much freedom do we allow for controversy <laughs> during times of crisis, and where are the limits? Thank you. Erin, um, shall we start with you, and then we'll move across? Oh, yeah. Sure, Can thank you for the questions. I think we could probably write a PhD on each of these questions, or a few. Uh, I mean, just to start with, when we talk about mis- and disinformation, sometimes it's very hard to know the difference between the two. There's usually a small, dedicated, sometimes paid, but very dedicated core that will curate and try to push forward disinformation. That is knowingly putting forward a false or misleading narrative. And then it is very hard very quickly when those narratives do take hold, that holistic manifestation of the snowball effect of people then believing that and sharing that that's misinformation. So there is a strong belief among that group that that is true. They aren't knowingly sharing false facts. They believe that to be true. And so you get very quickly into the mass public. And when we look at disinformation, whether it's state actors or more my territory, which is terrorist and violent extremists, countering, not territory for them, um, that's, that's really hard because it's a lot easier when you have bad guy holding bad guy logo with a picture and a selfie saying, I'm with bad guy group. And it's very hard when it starts trending and decentralizing. And the core has very much a shotgun effect. So they're trying to just put out as many weird alternatives as possible. And a lot of them fail. There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of disinformation that doesn't go very far. There's a lot of propaganda that doesn't catch. And then it only takes one or two pieces to catch and trend and snowball very quickly. And that's what's hard is to, the big part is identifying that core, because when you can do a strategic network disruption online, that's where you map out this type of core and you take them down all at once. And you're actually not necessarily looking for, so it's not all doom and gloom, there are tactics. You're not actually looking for the narrative. You're not using linguistic processes to find who that core is. You're actually looking at network behavior. Now, sometimes that might be bots, but oftentimes it's a, a way of actors' behavior online that leads you to believe that they are inauthentic. So you're actually looking for inauthentic, coordinated behavior. That might be the case that you start an account and overnight have 2,000 followers. Unless you're a Kardashian, that's not likely. Or you somehow manage to shoot out 1,000 messages that are amplified by your core network a hundred times in a short amount of time. So you actually are not looking at the content, you can actually follow behavioral signals and then track to see what that content is. So you can use tools and algorithms to find the behavior, to surface. The tools help you get to scale and speed, and then you train those to triage them to human review teams based on language, based on harms type. And so that's where it gets really interesting in this space, and when it gets to algorithms and echo chambers, the data is not always what you think. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the core areas where white supremacists and neo-Nazis hang out, or the core areas where Islamist extremist jihadists continue to hang out, they're not in the most open, amplified spaces. You're not finding them because of an algorithm suggesting them to you you're having an in-group. It's actually a very human offline behavior being taken into the online space of recommending people, creating friend networks, building familial networks. Uh, and oftentimes to break that echo chamber, we sometimes naively think, you know, just throw them a New York Times article and they'll become liberals overnight or something. And that's definitely not the case. 
I've watched, watched a lot of neo-Nazi groups share a lot of New York Times articles, and they rip them to shreds. So the issue is actually finding points of common grounds and cognitive openings to reach the group at a point of common ground and over time pivoting that opinion. And so it is true that to uh, correct bad ideas or misinformation, you need to actually counter flood with the right information, but it has to be packaged in a way that isn't necessarily the truth that speaks, it's the feeling of truthiness that is packaged to you. So a lot of this is actually a marketing discussion at the end of the day. Uh, and to that gray area, this is also a point where we get to the conversations. Tools can do a lot, but sometimes you have to question within democratic countries, what can you do, what should you do? And we are seeing a battle right now between three pillars that do not agree with each other. And those three pillars are, in my opinion, privacy, security, and free speech. And you cannot solve for just one. Every government has drawn their line in the sand between those three pillars to create their legal infrastructure. And tech companies are having to do the same. And some tech companies are opting more for privacy if they're end-to-end -end encrypted. You can understand that in a post-Snowden, post-Cambridge Analytica space. Others are opting more for free speech. If you go to America, obviously free speech is much more protected than anywhere else in the world. And if you go to parts of Asia, safety and security is more at the forefront. So platforms as well, just by where they're from culturally, they're drawing the lines in the sand in slightly different ways. And so that's, it's hard to say that there's going to be one path forward. Um, but those are the things to watch out for. There are tools and tactics, but we need to look at behavior more than content sometimes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Erin. And then we'll go over to Janke. So I will try to be very brief. But of course, we are speaking about uh, continuum of different issues, so sometimes it's very difficult to, to know what we are speaking about. I just, just want to say that on one hand, uh, people f for a long time are angry, stupid, uh, heinous, ill-intentioned, and okay, that's okay, that's humankind. So it will continue, we cannot fix this, and we don't have, we cannot, we don't have, we have not to try to fix it. The only issue is that do we have a social network that do emphasize this, that do polarize this, that create some hysteria? Erin, I did listen to your argument about the filter bubble and uh, echo chambers, but you, you, you spoke about small group of neo-Nazis. But for example, the 40% p the 40 of the, the American people that still believe that Trump won the election, they are not neo-Nazis. <laughs> They are more engaged in filter bubbles. So it depends on what about you are speaking. And there is something else. And yes, here I suggest to, to put the bar very high. But in France now, we have a doctrine and we have an agency to tackle disinformation. But we are very precise. We speak about disinformation if we have to face a foreign, hostile, massive, and artificial attack. And we need the four. But when we have to face the fourth, foreign, hostile, massive, and artificial, we consider that this is a direct attack on our sovereignty and that we have every right to answer by every manner, <laughs> even disconnecting servers, or I don't know. I don't know what the intelligence service will do, but we consider that this is a, a direct attack on our sovereignty. So yes, very often, I, I totally agree, um, unauthentic, uncoordinated behavior is one example of uh, artificial uh, attack. That's not the only one. Uh, clearly fake news, as I did mention with Barkhan and uh, Wagner Group, is another uh, approach. Um, so you can lie, you can, you can mobilize a lot of supporters. So they are not bots, because they are people, they are actual people, but they are coordinated. So, but this is always massive and artificial. So, and, and you understand my point. Some, something is very, very serious on a democracy and a sovereign state, in fact cannot agree, accept this. The other thing, maybe we, we have to be a bit more calm and tolerant because that's humankind and it will continue for, for all the eternity. Janka, the last word is uh, for you, I think, and then we need to, unless, sorry, Jeremy, was that, were you hoping to say something as well? I was going to ask a question for Henri, and, uh, but it could oh. easily get picked up. Um, okay, if, I, I, if, you, if you don't mind, Jeremy, I'll just say, let Janka speak first. Is do. that okay? Yeah. Sorry, she's been waiting so patiently. Thank you, thank you. I also should never have the last word. That's not good for me. <laughs> um, Stormy, I think uh, in, in that case, 
It's probably in that case relatively easy because I think we're, we're talking about what Aaron and, and Henry have already um, kind of picked out really well. You know, misinformation is something different and having an argument within a democratic society should be possible also when it gets a bit ugly or um, not super nice. Um, you know, that is still possible. I think it distracts us if we... Kind of if, I don't think that it's not something we need to deal with. I think it's something we need to deal with. But I think if we bundle it up in the disinformation debate, we probably um, don't get to the real issues that we really need to, um, to, to tackle, particularly with regard to foreign government actors, um, particularly with regard to terrorist actors. I think there is a, is a difference between kind of an insight and a domestic conversation um, and then one that is kind of a slightly bigger um, debate that we need to have uh, and that we haven't had. We've had it... Um, we have had it with regard to Russian disinformation, but we haven't really had it with regard to Chinese disinformation to the degree that it is necessary. And I would end with a little dis, uh, little um, commercial um, because uh, um, the EU is often not, but we had Ursula von der Leyen here today, and the EU is running a very, very good website that's called EU versus Disinfo um, that I can just suggest to everyone who has maybe not seen it yet, um, where they're trying to just do exactly that, pick up articles, look at that, kind of fact check, go through, and it's a tedious task, but I think it's actually in this case Case, um, a really good one for EU bureaucrats to look because they're very kind of tedious and they can do these things really well. Thank you, Janke um, and Jeremy. And then I think we'll um, close the session then. So over to you, Jeremy. Well, thank you for comparing it. And I've found it interesting, so I hope others uh, have uh, as well. I think the, uh, the only thing I pick up on is uh, Honor is absolutely right, as are the other panellists, that we need to be able to have the maturity to have that argument within a democratic society. And I'm more positive. I do think in our mature democracies, uh, people are beginning to recognise uh, what is and is not fake news. We're trying to call that out through the share programme we have in the UK, as are every other government mentioned, um, Yank has mentioned the, uh, the EU um, website. And in terms of the what we can measure, uh, attempts by foreign state actors have minimal um, penetration uh, um, by and large into um, I into the UK. But what we do see, uh, and I say this is a positive way, is a new generation becoming more aware of, of their vulnerabilities online. And when I'm in schools through my parliamentary duties and, and seeing teachers and seeing uh, kids in that context, uh, when they get taught, look, if you're online and someone says that they're also 12, they're not necessarily 12, be aware of what's going on on the internet. Uh, if uh, all the discussion in all our societies now about body image and what is projected on the internet, I think people are learning at an er earlier age to be more wary and more suspicious and more cynical about what comes through. So I think for a lot of mature democracies, uh, I'm hoping uh, that this is not too late, uh, that we can confront uh, with the plain unvarnished truth. And to the earlier question uh, uh, made, we must always be absolutely clear and truthful in uh, rebutting uh, disinformation. Uh, but there is a real battle going on on a broader global context. And uh, not everyone has the uh, good fortune to live in mature uh, democracies. And there is a, a wider uh, remit uh, where we need to be very, very aware of what disinformation is doing and the harm it is causing. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, we were a little worried as a panel before we started, given um, the, the time of the evening, and I'm sure you would all like to have another drink at the bar. So um, before you do that, please join us in thanking our fellow panellists, Henri, Jeremy, Erin, Rajesh, and Bianca. So.